good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's, let's start out with Amen. prayer. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this chance once again to come into your presence. We uh, ask your blessings, your filling in this place, and that, that these songs that we sing to you this morning will be a blessing to you and to us. We ask these things in Christ's holy name.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. The last verse in this song talks about it's it's one of those one of those that kind of chokes me up. But it talks about on that day when my strength is failing and the end draws near, my time has come. And then it proclaims, still my soul will sing your praise unending. 10,000 years and then forevermore. I guess hey, this is one of the songs that chokes me up a little bit. And, and uh, with your help, we'll get through it. And I, and I won't have to uh, lose my voice in any way. But if you wouldn't mind standing, if you are able, and we will sing this to the Lord this morning. It's a new day coming. 
It's time to sing your song again Forever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing in the evening time Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh, 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 my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and slow to end. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart.
this service and bless James and give us all hearts of flesh and not hearts of stone this morning. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. church. How's everybody doing this morning? Yes. Good deal, good deal. Glad to uh, see everybody gathered in the house of the Lord today. Uh, man, I praise God for his church because ultimately when you get here, we become a church and that's an exciting thing for me. I pray it's an exciting thing for you. Um, as you know, the ladies went to the Ham's Orchard yesterday um, if you benefited from that like I did and got some peach ice cream, that's an awesome thing, right? If you didn't, though, uh, that would encourage you to uh, either be able to go or try to be able to go next time or at least send a specific order for somebody. <laughs> uh, anyway, we're going to continue our journey through uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to pick up the second part of a conversation that we began uh, yesterday or last week uh, in John uh, 8 when we picked up in verse 12 and went down through verse 20. Today we're going to pick up in verse 21 and carry it down through uh, verse 30. So I'm going to ask that you would stand in honor of God's word. So he said to them again, I am going away. You will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He 
He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have, seen, what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was or that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he said these things, many believed in him. Our Heavenly Father God, we do thank you uh, for providing within us uh, the ability to seek after you, to hunger for your word, to thirst, to drink you in. And Father, I pray that today as we are gathered here, kind of echoing what Brother Keith prayed, Father, that our that our hearts would be uh, just filled with the Spirit of God. Father, that we would uh, um, not only desire to hear the Word of God, but that we would expect that the Word of God would move. So, Lord, we just ask during our time now that you would fill each and every one of us with the full power of the Holy Spirit, that your will would be done and not ours. Father, I ask you to stand me behind the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Uh, the title of this sermon is Separation of Time. And the reason that I chose that title is uh, for this. We saw in John chapter 7, verses 38 and following, that Jesus said that if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And, of course, he used the backdrop of uh, the water-pouring ceremony, most likely, at the Feast of Booths. Then we saw last week that Jesus, in a separate part of time, one was in the morning, this was most likely in the evening at the Feast of the Booths, Jesus stood up again at the, at the Candelia lighting ceremony and cried out, I am the light of the world. Whoever comes to me will not perish, but walk in the light of Christ. And so as we pick up that conversation, obviously there is a separation of time between those two remarks that Jesus made, one in the morning most likely, one in the evening most likely. <clears throat> but that reminded me that we're separated in time from Jesus too, as long as we are in the flesh. When we're in the flesh, we're here. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding on our behalf. So his time is different than our time today, but then there will become a time when all of our time is equal. When we as well are in the heavenly heavens with the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are heirs to the kingdom of heaven with him, if you know him as your Lord and Savior. If not, then you're still going to be separated by time, the time of eternal life from the time of eternal death. Considering that, I don't know about y'all, but uh, I spend an awful lot of time on the road, traveling from one destination to the next, going to visit, uh, coming to the church, doing different chores, activities, whatever the case may be, I spend a lot of time on the road. And uh, I didn't ask them, I'm just going to throw them right under the bus and go from there. But, you know, we got these apps on our phone now that are directional, directional apps, right? 
And, and one of those apps is called Waze. And I think John and I both agreed in the beginning of the time when Angela and Wendy desired that everywhere we go we use Waze, that John and I pretty much agreed that Waze takes us ways out of the way. Because <laughs> we never seem to get there. Now, Wendy and Angela would say that it's because John and I don't listen to that thing. Well, there may be some truth behind that. But let me ask you, have you ever been on a journey? Have you ever uh, set out to go somewhere? And somewhere along the way, maybe your GPS system waited till the very last minute, like a lot of them do, and says, turn now. As you're doing 75 miles an hour, in, in coming up on that turn. You have a choice to make at that point. You either lock it down and pull your Dukes of Hazard move and make the turn, or you just keep on going. Well, if you keep on going, what happens? That app comes on, and it immediately says, recalculating. Recalculating, in other words, you were too dumb to figure out where you needed to go to begin with, now I gotta fix you again, right? Similarly, that's what we're looking at in this story. The Pharisees are set out on a journey, and, and, and they're headed in one direction. The problem is they are thinking that they're using the appropriate map, the Torah, the first five books of, of, of the Old Testament. They think they're using the proper, proper map, and in a sense they are. The problem is, that like many of us men, they think they know better. And so for, for, for them to believe and for them to listen to Jesus, Jesus is continually telling them, as we've seen over and over and over and over again, recalculate. Recalculate. Rethink where your destination is. Rethink how you're supposed to get to your destination. Considering that, <clears throat> your first point then is smugly confident. Smugly confident. It's kind of a, a harsh point or a harsh way to say that, I think, but the reality of it is <clears throat> we can become smugly people like the Pharisees were with Jesus when we think we know better than somebody else, right? Here's the thing. We can do that irregardless of whether we're right or we're wrong. But we, seem to, but we seem to camp out on that more so when we're wrong than when we're right. The Pharisees, they know or believe anyway that they are the uh, religious all-star. They have the greatest education. They studied at the yeshiva. Uh, they have the greatest education because they studied specifically under a particular rabbi. They are, are looked upon by all of, all of uh, Jerusalem and, and predominantly all of Israel as the men that are uh, theologically trained to the highest level, and so they know everything. Jesus in our text says, oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Not only that, but the Pharisees think that when Jesus said, these are my people, and gave them the promised land, they thought right then and there that that sealed their eternity with our Heavenly Father God. But here's the thing, and, and I don't know if you've studied your Bible enough to, to figure this out, and if not, uh, that's an encouragement to continue to be a student of the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. But when God chose the Israelites to be his chosen people, the Jewish community in, in Jerusalem to be his, his chosen people, the expectation of that was that his message would go far and wide. 
that it would exceed the boundaries of the city of Jerusalem. And then during that time, if you go to Jerusalem with us at next March, during that time it would exceed the boundaries of the old city of Jerusalem. Yet the religious leaders there desired to keep that within themselves and keep that within the boundaries of the city. Jesus begins our text today by saying, I am going away. I am going away. And you know, this isn't the first time that we've heard Jesus say this, is it? As a matter of fact, in chapter 7, verse 33, Jesus almost says the exact same thing there that he sat, says here. The difference is they thought of it differently. Why? Because they're smug. See, in chapter 7, verse 33, Jesus says, I'm going away. Where I'm going, you cannot come. The religious leaders at that particular point thought that he was going to the dispersion of the Jews or the dispersion of the Greeks. Why? Because they didn't like them. They want to have nothing to do with them. They thought that if, if Jesus went to the dispersion of the Greeks, then guess what? They would not follow him because they would not go on that ground. Similarly to that of Samaria. Remember, uh, the, Jesus intentionally went through Samaria, the area that the majority of Jews would go around so that they didn't even have to touch a toe of their sandal on Samaritan soil. Right? But here Jesus says, I am going away. And he follows it up with, you will seek me. You will seek me. You will seek me, giving the implication that you're not going to find me. I'm going to leave. You're going to look for me. And you're not going to find me. Why? Because Jesus came for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was to seek and save the lost and give us a passageway from earth to eternity in heaven. But because of the smug confidence that the Pharisees have, and even some of the Jews most likely in the city at this time, they believe their destination is secure, and so they're not worried about it. Jesus says, you will seek me. See, they're thinking of the, 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 the Messiah that's going to come upon the scene. He's going to be a conquering king. He's going to come in and right the wrongs, for lack of better words. He's going to fix all of the problems. He's going to, at this particular point in time, he's going to crush the head of the Romans. Because that's whose oppression the Jews are under at this time. But this Jesus that's telling them that he is the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Son of God, he's not doing any of that. He's humble. He's, he's gracious. He's loving. And the Jews just don't know what to do with that. They don't know what to do with that. Then Jesus drops this bomb on him. He's been pretty polite up to this point. <clears throat> but now Jesus says, not only am I going away, not only will you seek me, but you're going to die in your sin. In other words, Jesus is saying, Though you think you're right, you're wrong, I'm right, and because I'm right, you're going to die in your sin. And the Jews knew well enough to know that if they died in their sin, that would essentially mean that that was a rejection of God the Father, therefore they would not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, you're going to die in that sin. If you don't straighten your act up. As a matter of fact, in chapter 5, in verse 39, 
What did we study and learn out of that particular chapter and out of that particular verse? Jesus, in a confrontation with the people again, said there, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But it is those very words that testify to me. So Jesus is saying, it's been two years and six months since I began to aggravate you. It's been two years and six months since many of the people that used to honor you and respect you and sit under your teaching have departed from you because now then... They feel like, though you think I'm a heretic, you are. Jesus said, you will seek me, you will not find me, you're going to die in your sins. Or you die in your sin. What sin? What sin? Ironically, as I was studying this and thinking about this, I, I couldn't help but get a little bit of a smile on my face. Because a lot of times when you're out evangelizing people, you know, and, and you ask them, have you ever told a lie, and I did this to y'all, and y'all you know, fell for it perfectly. <laughs> but have you ever told a lie? They say, yeah. You said, yeah. Said, you ever stolen anything? You said, yeah. They said, yeah. Right? Have you ever lost it over somebody? You said, yeah. They said, yeah. You say, so what you're saying is you violated the law of God. Therefore, you have no salvation within you. Right? Jesus is saying to them here that, that not only are you going to die in your sin, but I have given you more than ample time to figure it out. More than ample time to figure it out. And because he gave them more than ample time to figure it out, the thing that made me cackle, the thing that made me smile was this. When you're doing that evangelism, or whenever we did it here in the church just for an exercise to see how honest you were, right? Jesus says you're going to die in your sin. Do you realize that it doesn't matter if you're a lying, thieving, adulterous, murderer, blasphemer, dishonorer, coveter? You know, it doesn't matter if you're all of those things. What matters is the most important thing. Where is Jesus in your life? Because the, the one sin that's going to keep you from heaven is the rejection of Jesus Christ. All them other sins are irrelevant. They can't save you by confessing them. The only thing that can save you is Jesus Christ. Jesus says in, in chapter 14, once we get there, I am the truth and the way, and the life. No one, hear me say that, no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, if you reject me, that is the one abominable sin that is going to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. But watch this. Just as there's only one sin that will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. There's only one decision that can get you into the kingdom. Right? And that decision is to, to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believe in Him. Follow Him. Study Him. Pray to Him. Grow in Him. And as students of the Bible, even sharpen one another by studying Him. Jesus says, You're going to die in your sin, boys. I want you to notice what happens next, though. 
that passes through them, and parents, you understand this statement, it passes through them like their head is empty, and it goes in one ear and directly out the other. And if you're a parent in this room, you know what I'm talking about there, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't have to just write it out for you. You got it. The reality of it is, they didn't focus on Jesus saying that sin is going to keep you from heaven. They focused on him saying, I'm going away and you can't find me. So much so that what do they say? <clears throat> they say to Jesus, or they say about Jesus, Will he kill himself? Will he kill himself? Now, I want you to understand that if what they were thinking actually applied and Jesus ultimately committed suicide, all of a sudden, everything that they had been saying about Jesus would have become true. Right? And here's why. During Jesus' time, it was a heinous sin to commit suicide. As a matter of fact, uh, Josephus, one of the uh, historians from that time, tells us that the body of a suicide was not buried until after sunset and carried to the grave without normal funeral rites. In other words, if you committed suicide, we weren't even going to acknowledge your death. We're going to take you out during the night and bury you then so nobody else sees. The part of the, the atonement which I've taught you all about, <clears throat> known as the Mishnah, one, of the, uh, one that was compiled in the first century B.C., it ex is its it is explicitly hostile towards suicide, stating, whenever a person of sane mind destroys his own life, he shall not, we shall not be bothered with him. In other words, that person stepped in to a desire and committed a, a, what the Jews considered at that time a heinous act. Therefore, just let him rot there. We ain't even going to bother burying him. And then one modern writer, Leon Morris, says, the Jews thought that a person who killed himself would go to the worst place of hell. To the worst place of hell. So these Jewish religious leaders are thinking, not only are we discrediting Jesus, not only are we uh, um, I'm trying to dishonor his, his uh, teaching and preaching abilities, but if this cat goes away and commits suicide, then we win. Then we can say, see, I told you so. He was a liar. He was a blasphemer. He, he, he was a false prophet. And then they could tell the rest of the Jews, and all of you were ignorant enough to follow after him instead of staying devoted to our teaching. But unfortunately, the very same people that are saying, what's he going to do, kill himself? Are the very same people that did crucify him six months later. And here's the crazy thing about that. And Again, you have to study your Bible. Uh, I'm going to share with you, but if you weren't here when I preached through the Sermon on the Mount, or you've never read these verses, I would encourage you to read them so that you can put in context what I'm saying to you and, and, and ultimately become a, a, a Bible, better Bible student. But not only are the people that are saying will he kill himself are the very people that are ultimately going to crucify him six months later. But guess what? In Matthew chapter 7, the last 
two verses in that chapter, verse 51, or the last three verses in that chapter, verse 51 through 53, let us know that Jesus literally made sure they felt it when he died. What does it say? What does Matthew 27 say? The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split open. The tombs also opened. And many bodies of sinners who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs. Not only were they wrong about Jesus committing suicide, they were the murderers themselves. But Jesus illustrated to them, you will seek me, but you will not find me. Why? Because you're seeking after the wrong Messiah. I am here so much so that I'm going to send you a warning message the moment I draw my last breath. And you're literally going to feel that I was the Messiah. So you can be smugly confident all you want. You're still going to hell. Second point is separation of time. Jesus, as always, has presented significant evidence for the claim that he's making. Right? What is the claim that he's making here? You're going to die in your sin. Unless what? You believe in me. You follow me? Right? If you don't receive me as your Lord, if you don't believe the scriptures that you have at your fingertips, then you, when your body perishes, you're the ones that are going to be going to the darkest, deepest place of hell. Not me. So for us, and let me say this, for those that are here today or on the video or in the parking lot or radio or wherever you're catching us, for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, we can find great joy in the fact that Jesus is who he is and that we are going to uh, ultimately ascend into the kingdom of heaven. So our time only temporarily is separated from Jesus' time. Just a moment in time. Why? Because we know that the Bible says that God's time is different than us. Right? That, that, that one day is as if a hundred years to him. So we're separated in time only momentarily, but in a minute, we're going to be with Jesus and our time is going to be the same. For those of you who know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus goes on to say, you are from below. In other words, you're born in the flesh. You, at the moment you were conceived, inherited Adam and Eve's sin. Jesus says, I am from above. Radically different. Right? Right? Your sinful flesh, I am awesome God, right? You're of this world, the contaminated place that you're trying to have dominance over, this hell on earth, but I'm not. I'm from another world. I'm not of this world. In other words, Jesus is of the world of eternity. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins. Verse 24. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. <coughs> Three things I want you to notice in that one verse. First off, we saw in verse 21 that Jesus said you will die in your sin. Singular. 
Now we're three verses later, uh, and, and we're in verse 24, and Jesus says, you're going to die in your sins, plural. I already stated to you that there's only one sin that keeps you out of heaven, and that's rejecting Jesus as Lord and Savior. So why does Jesus now say, you will die in your sins? Well, let's think about that for a minute. You ever know anybody told you a lie? I'm sure we all have known somebody. We might even be that person. Right? And then when called out on that lie, that person has to tell another lie to substantiate the first lie. And before you know it, the lie has just began to roll like a snowball, getting bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that some people, and this is reality in the world we live in today, some people become so infatuated to and are so addicted to telling lies that they become habitual liars mm -hmm. and they don't even realize what the truth is anymore. Jesus is saying that one sin that's going to keep you from heaven, you're just piling more on top of there. So all the stuff you do is going to keep you from heaven. But not only that, you don't believe in me. Jesus gives it a clear, clear statement here. Unless you believe in me. Unless you believe in me. What does believe mean? Believe in Greek is pisteo, which is a verb, gives the implication that, 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 that actions are going to take place once you make a decision. It's the same verb uh, that was used in John 3.16 when I taught you there that the verb illustrates a right now and continuous process. That believe is actually uh, more understood, understandably as a as a plural word means keep on believing. The best way I can describe that to you is this. I don't know if anybody is familiar with it or not, but <clears throat> if you are, then you'll understand. If not, come see me later and I'll explain it. The program called Alcoholics Anonymous. There's also a program called Narcotics Anonymous and then other programs for whatever addiction you may be. Because we're all addicted to something, right? But in the AA and NA meeting, the biggest thing that is pushed out of that, and for any uh, center, center is in facility that tries to help people overcome their addictions, the very first and most important new thing you learn is today's the only one you got. You stay sober today and you can worry about tomorrow. But here's what happens with, a, with an alcoholic or an addict. A lot of times we tend to put the wagon in front of the horse and cause a train wreck. A buggy wreck, I guess. Right? And what happens then? We relapse. Right? <clears throat> so Jesus is saying, praise God that you believe in me today. And if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would suggest you do that. Because it's not me pointing to you. It's Jesus pointing to you. Whether on that video, on that radio, in this building, Jesus is pointing to you and he says, unless you believe, unless you believe, you're going to die. Today you believe. Tomorrow, the Lord desires to give it to you. You believe then. And you keep on believing. It's not a one and done, I'm 
I'm believing in you today, and don't hear me say, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation because we don't believe that, right? But it, it's not a one and done. You don't say, okay, Jesus, I believe in you today. And then everybody that knows you looks at you and, and you said, oh, I'll put my faith in Jesus today. Or six months later, the person that you told you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior comes across you and they see the things you're doing. And, and, and you say, I thought you said you put your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they're like, I did. It'd be terrifying to hear these words, wouldn't it? And these are my favorite words that I like to use now. I'm glad that you make that claim. However, the claim that you're making doesn't align with the salvation that is identified in the Bible. Therefore, if I were you, I would check that salvation. You see, the Bible clearly teaches us Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If we go on living a life of despicable sin, claiming to be a believer in Jesus Christ, there is a disconnect there, beloved. Something has gone radically wrong. Believe in what? Believe that I am he. I am he. These Jews knew what Jesus was saying. He says, Ego of me, I am. I am. This ain't the first time he's told us that either. Here he says, I am he. Okay? And, 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 and when he says, I am he, he's basically saying, and they realize this, I am God. I am God. So that would lead us to your third point then that we'll go through relatively quickly. quickly. And that is willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. You know you're wrong. Yet you willfully try to stay that way. Jesus says that I am he. They would have known this had they not kept going back to the temple, back, back rooms of the temple and having those business meetings determining on how they're going to kill Jesus or how they're going to get rid of this blasphemer, or how they're going to win back their converts, instead of going and having those business meetings, if, if, if they would have listened to Jesus, and gone back and, and, and began to study the scriptures over again, maybe they would have found out that he really was him. But that's what happens a lot of times. We think we know the word of God, therefore we utilize the word of God, Unfortunately, the majority of the time, we take the Word of God out of context, and we're not saying anything remotely close to what the Word of God actually says. And that's a big problem. That's also how cults are started. Just so you know. And they have success because the people are willfully ignorant. Isaiah 41.4 says, who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. Isaiah 43, 10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. They would have known immediately who Jesus was when he said, I am. Because they, like I did, took you last week, would go straight back to Exodus 3, right? To the burning bush episode. If you don't know what that is, go to Exodus 3 and read that, right? 
But go back to the burning bush, ep burning bush episode where Moses is standing in front of the burning bush and, and he says, who am I to tell him send me? And God says, I am. Tell him, I am who I am sent you. They would have known that. But look, they had Isaiah as well. As a matter of fact, what I've already taught you is not only did they have the entire Old Testament, it was already translated into Greek. They were absolutely without excuse. Jesus says, you will die in your sin. You will die in your sins. Why? Because you have everything in front of you to teach you exactly who I am, and you are willfully ignorant and just trying to discredit me. And he says, dropping down to verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Dropping from there down to verse 28 says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. So Jesus doesn't only say, not only am I God in flesh, not only am I the prophesied uh, Savior of the world that Isaiah talked about, I'm going to attach one more title to myself. I'm the son of man. And just for the record, our God is an awesome God. And so when I was preparing all of this, and I was actually at the end of this sermon series and the new sermon series, but when I was studying all of this, right, what is Jesus saying? He says, you know who I am because you know the burning bush episode. Therefore, you hate me and you call me a blasphemer. <coughs> Some of you think that I am the prophet that Isaiah prophesied about. Right? But just in case you didn't get that, Daniel said in Daniel chapter 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away, and his kingdom one that shall never be destroyed. <clears throat> Burning bush should have got it. Isaiah should have got it. If you couldn't figure it out there, when you read Daniel 7 verse 13, if you didn't get it there, that just willfully, ignorantly puts your willful ignorance on super high. Because Jesus now has, in this one little section, attached three different titles to himself. God in flesh, God incarnate, come down from heaven into the flesh, right? I am the one that your scriptures prophesied about, not only in Daniel, but also in Isaiah. So I'm God in flesh. I'm the one that you were told was going to come to be God in flesh. And not only that, but I'm the author of the very scriptures that you're trying to tell me that I'm not fulfilling. I don't know about y'all, but man, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? And I know it's easy for us to judge, right? It's easy for us to say, oh, well, you know. Jesus was walked up on us today. We'd probably act the same way. Well, you know what? You, you're absolutely right. We probably would at first. But did you know that there's going to be a day that Jesus does return? And there are going to be those that have not perished yet. And so here's the thing. They're going to need to do the same thing that we need to do today. 
they're going to need to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Right? As Keith comes up and we close uh, here with the with an invitation, I uh, I just want to share with you this. Jesus over and over and over again patiently teaches. He gives you every opportunity to know who he is. He gave them every opportunity to know who they are. Today, I'm giving you the opportunity. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in a moment you slip out of that pew and come on down here and do that. If you have somehow or another fallen out of line with Jesus and you need to recalculate, you need to get your uh, 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 spiritual GPS back in order, come on up here. Maybe you're praying for those that just need to know Jesus. There's a place for you here with, this, with that as well. And then watch this. Have you noticed yet that Jesus says, unless you keep believing? In other words, there is still hope for these Pharisees. And so here's the crazy thing, church. Do you realize that if they would have said, as many people did down here in, in the last verse, verse 30, many believed in him? Do you know if the Pharisees would have said that? The conversation would have been instantly changed. And, and, and they could have entered into the kingdom of heaven instead of into the darkness of the abyss below. So I don't know where you're at, and I, I really don't. And it's dangerous for a, a pastor to ever just think he knows where his congregation is because it's already been illustrated here over the last seven years. You walk into a place and you know where everybody is, you're either going to continue to lead those that don't know Jesus into hell because you were arrogant enough to think that you knew that everybody was safe or you're going to keep on giving an invitation. And as you've already witnessed, people are going to come forward. All right? Brother James has been in this church years. Came forward. Several others in this congregation and some that have passed through this congregation, they claimed that they believed in Jesus. Only to sit with, a, with me or somebody else in this church in an intimate conversation and realize that they had never put their faith and trust in Jesus. I told y'all I don't I don't I won't marry anybody without first giving uh, some 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 uh, premarital counseling. You hear me say this? I'm not a counselor. We got counsel. We got a counselor in here if you need one, right? But I'm not him. Okay. But I do give biblical premarital counseling for this reason. I I believe that if I do my due diligence to try to make sure that a man and woman enter into a covenant relationship before God, and, 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 and in doing so, they at least, if nothing else, understand the, the biblical understanding of, of what marriage looks like, then maybe they'll have a little hope. But let me tell you this. The last two... Biblical counseling session, premarital biblical counseling sessions that I've done. In both of those sessions, one or the other did not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
and spent their whole lives thinking they did. We can't just assume. You can't assume your child knows. You can't assume your spouse knows. You can't assume your friend knows. If we assume, we just assume them right into the lake of fire. The altar is yours. It's here for you. And I think I said it last week, but if I didn't, I'm going to say it this week. If this table is keeping you from coming here because you think there's not enough room for you, I will move it over there, and this home will be over there so that this entire altar is open to you even if you had to crawl up here to get to it. Our Father in heaven, your word says, if you believe, unless you believe. Father, I pray for those that come to this campus that if they don't believe, that they would believe. I pray for those that we minister to in, in the, the middle school, that if they don't believe, that they would begin to believe. I pray for those in the city that we will evangelize, that if they don't believe, that they would believe. Father, I believe that if we are obedient to your word, that people's lives would radically be turned upside down. Because the reality of it is, the harvest is ripe. The laborers are few. And unless we present the gospel and give an invitation, people are still dying without you. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it molds and shapes us more into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray.